Welcome to Guys Telling Stories. I'm your host, Rich Douglas, and we have a fantastic guest for you today. If the name Captain Tammy Jo Schultz sounds familiar, that's because she is the Southwest Airlines captain who found herself wrestling a passenger-filled commercial airliner back to the ground on April 17th, 2018. I remember seeing this story in the news, and it was Southwest Flight 1380. It was departing from New York City, and it was headed for Dallas, Texas. About 20 minutes into the flight, They had catastrophic engine failure and rapid cabin depressurization. And Tammy Jo, along with her crew, found themselves reacting using all their years of training and instincts to safely land this plane. What I'm hoping to get out of the interview today is to hear her story, to find out what type of training she had to become a pilot. In fact, I know she had extensive training as a pilot in the U.S. Navy which you can imagine would help her on a day like April 17th. And along those same lines too, I'd love to hear the story from her eyes and her ears, what she saw, what she heard on that day, and what was life like for her after. Tammy Joe also has a memoir coming out, Nerves of Steel, How I Followed My Dreams, Earned My Wings, and Faced My Greatest Challenge. So I'd love to talk to her a little bit more about the book as well. Quick reminder, if you're new to the show, be sure to hit subscribe on wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us some feedback in the comment section on your favorite part of Tammy Joe's story. All right, let's talk to Captain Tammy Joe Schultz. Captain Tammy Joe, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're very excited to have you on. I know you have a new book coming out, Nerves of Steel. I can... I could imagine you're probably busy with that, but uh, are you still are you still busy with regular life too? Oh yes, yes. I'm I'm on a trip as we speak. We took off from Detroit early this morning, went to Denver, and now we're in Tucson for kind of an early afternoon. So I took a break to talk to you. Ah, uh, well, thank you so much. Um, before we get too far into your story, can you tell people who are listening where's the best place for them to go online to maybe learn a little bit more about you and and the book? Well, you can go to CaptainSchultz.com, and Schultz is not spelled normally. It's S-H-U-L-T-S, no C, no Z, and that is my husband's fault. But (laughs) go to CaptainSchultz.com, and you can pull up uh, the first four chapters of Nerves of Still for free, and uh, so you can kind of get a taste of it. Well, that sounds great. Uh, we always like to start these interviews by diving right in and, and maybe taking people back to the beginning. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your upbringing, you know, where did you grow up? Sure. What was life like? Yeah, well, I grew up in um, northern New Mexico, a little bit in Colorado, and then dipped back down to southern New Mexico from about fourth grade on. And uh, my my parents ranched and farmed and so we we had a lot of outdoor chores growing up, which was great. Um, it also introduced me to aviation, even though I didn't grow up around it. I grew up underneath it <laughs> uh, with them doing the jets from Holloman Air Force Base anchored their dogfighting over our big hay barn. So uh, as I was mucking out stalls and stock trailers of organic fertilizer, I would see this air show overhead and just think that looked pretty cool. Uh, then I read a book. Uh, we didn't have television or telephone on our ranch. And so books were a great way to just kind of get a, a view of somebody else's world. And I read Jungle Pilot. It's about a, a bush pilot named Nate Saint. And, um, that kind of helped me put kind of glue to the back of the puzzle pieces that I had about aviation on how do you get in there? What does it really look like from the cockpit? I felt like I got to see aviation from behind a pilot's eyes. And so that, that was, as far as I was concerned, that was it. Um, when I went to career day, I realized that my world was very different than the world outside because the colonel, that greeted me said, uh, well, are you lost? <laughs> and I said, no, I signed up for aviation. And he said, well, this is career day, not hobby day. You may want to go find something girls can do. Oh, wow. And I didn't, 
I took a seat really quickly and just kept my head down and my mouth shut because I, it wasn't my school. I didn't have anywhere to, else to go and the buses were locked. So it wasn't out of this grand defiance that I did it. I just didn't have any place else to go. And it sounded just like what I thought it would be like. Um, but I headed home, told my folks, hey, you know what? Girls don't fly for a living. And they, they said, well, then go to plan B, but keep going in life. You know. And uh, after college, I happened to run into a, um, an Air Force woman pilot uh, during a winging that I went to go see a friend at in advance. She, she was a biology major. And so I thought, okay, I can do this and try it again. It took me a couple more years to find a way in. And the Navy was actually the only, only branch of the military that would allow me to even take the test. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, and, and then it took me a couple more years to find the Navy recruiter that would, would process the test. But Anyway, during that time, I I didn't sit on my laurels. I mean, I I had two or three jobs going at the same time because uh, just just because a a dream or a plan doesn't work out doesn't mean you sit back and just go oh you know I'm waiting until I get my corner office. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it doesn't life doesn't really work that way, and. So that was, I finally found my way in uh, 1985, uh, March. I was down in Pensacola, Florida and got my head shaved and did push-ups with everybody else at AOCS, Aviation Officer Candidate School, until we headed to flight school. Let me ask you, you mentioned that you went to college. Did did attending college in any way like influence you or help you help you actually get in? No, I, I, I believed the man when he said that girls don't fly for a living. So I went for my second choice, which was to be a vet, a veterinarian. And so I studied pre-med and agribusiness. I see. And they didn't have an aviation at my college, and nor did they have a ROTC program. So I really didn't have any other aviation influence around me. Well, we had a uh, U.S. Navy SEAL on last season who was oh, very cool. telling us a little bit about his his training, and it, it really was uh, almost unbelievable to hear some of some parts mm-hmm. of his story. So, a, as you're getting the head shaved, and you are uh, you're in basic training, uh, what, what was life like for you during that time? You know, they they did a great job of just. Um, it, women were you know, pretty new to the program there, but um, they did a great job of not, if it, if they highlighted us at all, it was to make fun of us more, to work us out a little more, to make us do more push-ups, you know. And so the guys, uh, our classmates kind of felt like, man, we're so lucky to have girls that kind of take the steam off, you know, the heat off of us. Um, and so I felt like it was, um, I mean, it was boot camp. It was supposed to be tough. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, and there's the there's a camaraderie that develops with uh, with the other people that you're with, and 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 that can take you a long way. I had a little advanced copy of the book, and I noticed the one part that caught my eye. Uh, you met your husband while in the navy. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Yeah. What? What? How did that uh, relationship unfold? Uh, well, at the time. Um, Sure. After I got my wings, my skipper from T2s uh, requested that I come back to instruct, which is an honor, really. You have to have a, a, a good GPA. You have to have a threshold of a good GPA, and you have to be invited. And I had a great skipper in T2s, Commander Grant. We still keep in touch. And he invited me back to instruct. And about uh, halfway through my two-year instructor, instructor tour there, um, I got a call from one of the guys at the squadron. He was not my student, but he, he, uh, was looking for an instructor going across country. His buds all had instructors and a jet to go on a three day weekend cross country, which is, is a required flight. So you learn how to fly into different 
airports and navigate and things like that. But he said he couldn't find an instructor. And it's so funny because the more I tell this story, the more fishy it sounds. It does. But <laughs> he, uh, so it already doesn't sound right, but it gets worse or better. I don't know which way to say that. Uh, but so there was four jets, uh, an instructor and a, and a student in each jet. And his dad had a place near the ski area in Rio de Janeiro, New Mexico, near where I grew up. And so the other instructors had told him, call Ensign Bonnell. I mean, she'll she'll go on a cross country with you. So, you know, she's from that area. So he called me and I made sure he had his flights that he needed to be qualified for the cross country. And the night before we leave, I get a call from every other instructor. Oh, I'm sorry. My my student went mad down. Oh, I'm sorry. My student didn't finish his flights. He's not qualified to go. Oh, I'm sorry. My girlfriend's coming in town. I'm not going. And so then it's just this guy and me. And yeah. um, <laughs> it's either okay, meant to I'm be or a little this. fishy there. I, I don't know that this will look right, you know. Uh, so I called my folks because they're, they're total prudes. I knew they would <laughs> steer me right, uh, you know to safety and they said oh tammy joe you're the only girl in the squadron i mean you're gonna always be the only girl on the trip you like to ski you like to fly go yeah. so uh, i did he was charming funny but i thought yeah i'm grading him he needs to be charming and funny but <laughs> i have to say 31 years later he is still charming and funny and uh he ended up uh learning everything uh everything he knows from you basically or <laughs> Um, everything good, everything good. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Only, only as good aviation moves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as we move the story right along, if maybe you want to talk a little bit, uh, how you transitioned, cause sometimes people spend their whole career with the military. Sometimes you right. find yourself in a second career. So, uh, in right. starting to work for Southwest, maybe you could talk a little bit about that transition time out of the, out of the service sure. and, and, and how you started working there. Sure. Well, I was in the transition time in the Navy and really in the whole military aviation. And that was when Congress was looking at whether or not to lift the combat exclusion law. So there was a couple of us that were chosen to fly A-7 weapons. We went on the weapons detachment and that was before women were flying combat and did fine. And so about a year later, we were selected to fly the F-18 and um, they hadn't had women there before. Um, And so at the point of which I would either take another tour or get out, they had decided the Congress had decided and they lifted the combat exclusion law, but the line drawn was right behind my year group. So uh, it was only behind me that was eligible to go to combat squadrons. And it was a wise decision because I was at that point where I would be either a super JO or a lieutenant commander going out uh, on cruise for the first time and yet being in a position of leadership. So they were wise in, in making that cut, but it just put me on an easy decision to go ahead and get out at that time. I flew over forest fires for a summer there in California and then, Got my 737 type rating and started at Southwest the next spring, 19, uh, let's see, 94. Okay. We are huge Southwest fans here on the podcast. I'll, oh, just, sure. I'll just say that. Yeah, we, we've we gotten the companion pass before we had our first child. And we oh, my goodness. And then uh, we, we were able to sneak in a few trips when he was first born. I think uh, by two, three months, he was he was on a plane already, a Southwest flight to Chicago. And we, we t- took him around the city. Now, now he's almost two, so it's a little harder to – he's a little bit more difficult on an airplane, but – yeah. <laughs> uh, but in in deciding to, to work for them, what would a typical day for yourself or your husband, a pilot, look like? You know, I was trying to think, like yesterday is a typical day in that I commuted from San Antonio to Houston. So I drove from our home in Bernie and caught a flight, Southwest flight, over to Houston, spent the night, and then started in the morning and flew Houston to um, 
New Orleans, and then New Orleans to Atlanta, Atlanta to Chicago, and then Chicago to Detroit, and spend the night. It sounds like you spend just almost your whole week literally up in the air. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and if not, you know, just sort of you know, a little bit of downtime before the next flight. Uh, I don't think by any means it, that is an uneventful week, flying all over the country back and forth. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad you sort of laid that out for us, because if we can sort of dive into um, your successful sure. landing of Southwest Airlines Flight 1380, that was anything yeah. but uh, a regular routine kind of day. So I, I, always, right. I always like to ask, and, and please, you know, tell us, you know, in detail what that day was like, you know, your eyes, your ears, uh, what happened that day? I'm trying to think at a good point to start. So I think I'll just start on the runway. We're leaving LaGuardia. We'd already flown from Nashville to LaGuardia that morning. And then it was Darren's turn to fly. So he's taking off there in LaGuardia. We head towards Dallas, which is about three and a half, four hours away. And we're heavy with fuel for that long a flight. And we're full of passengers. And um, passing 32,500 feet, we just uh, get t-boned by a mac truck uh so to speak and hear an explosion darren and i both comparing notes later thought we'd been hit by another aircraft wow the jolt was so severe the aircraft snapped into a left roll um and we both jumped on the, the grabbed the yoke and started straightening it, it you know leveling the wings and we could see the flash of the engine instruments but Honestly, that was about a tenth of a second, and then we couldn't see anything. It was shuddering so violently that we couldn't focus our eyes on instruments, checklists, anything, and there was a a cloud of smoke pulled up into the cockpit, and then we had this piercing pain in, in our ears, and we realized we weren't able to breathe either, so... Um, that's, you know, that's kind of an isolating moment to not be able to hear, to, uh, communicate any way, to really see anything or to breathe. And I remember that adrenaline, when it kicks in, it, it makes you think really fast so that in a tiny slice of a moment, you, you can put a very leisurely thought process in it. And so I, uh, I remember just thinking at that point, I, I mean, I'm not sure everything we need to stay on the aircraft is going to stay there until we land. Right. I, don't, I don't know. And of course that, when you follow that thought process to the end, it's, I mean, I felt like I was kind of running to this mental cliff of what ifs. And that would mean that, you know, this is the day I meet my maker. And it was interesting because that thought to stop the run to the edge of the cliff. And I thought, oh, you know what? I won't be meeting a stranger. I meet with him every morning. And so I just kind of backed away from that bad news trail of thought and thought, okay, good news is we're still flying. Everybody on this airplane may not have the same thought process I do right now. And so we'll just keep flying. And I really backed away from there with, I think, the calm that you hear in my voice on the way down. Because uh, we had a lot to figure out on the way down. And I needed, uh, you know, that freedom of, of and the flexibility of thought that comes whenever you're calm. Well, from a passenger standpoint, I'm, I'm assuming or picturing uh, cabin depressurization. Maybe those masts are falling down. From a from a pilot standpoint, once you have that moment of clarity, what does the cockpit the cockpit look like, and 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 what's the next yeah. few steps you take? So the next few steps uh, I take and. In- and Darren and I are doing it together, is getting our oxygen masks on. They don't fall down. We have to pull them out of their locked position. 
So we, we put our oxygen masks on and talk to ATC, make sure we're pointed in the right direction while we're coming down. Um, and then maintaining aircraft control and, and then uh, navigating so that you're going the right direction and then communicating. So we told them we'd like to go towards Philly. We had a long runway, good medical, and it was the right distance for what we thought we had. And then I, I punched into the PA system and just made an announcement because I, I thought, you know, we're up here and it was rather startling what just happened. So if you're in the back and you don't have any idea what just happened, it's really got to be startling. You know, we lost like 19,000 feet in the first five minutes. So it was, you know, it was definitely um, a, a steep descent as well as, you know, this horrendous roar caused by a window being open and then the shuddering caused by the cowling that was peeled back but still attached. So you had this barn door and a hurricane effect going on underneath the wing and um, and then not being able to breathe. Uh, even though you get your oxygen mask on, that's still disconcerting. So I just punched into the back PA system and said, we're not going down, we're going into Philly. And of course, you know, it's a bad day whenever that's a comforting PA. But that was what uh, the flight attendants heard that and unbuckled and just headed down the aisle to help people get their oxygen masks on and to tell them, we have a plan. You know, we're going into Philly. We're not going down. We're going into Philly. And um, these ladies did not have to unbuckle and go down the aisle. It was so violently shuddering that by the book, they could have, should have stayed buckled up, but they faced this horribly rough ride that gave them sprained back, bruised ribs, cuts, bruises all over in order to help people. And so that one of the takeaways I would say is just that element of hope that doesn't always change our circumstances. It didn't us, but it did change. It didn't change our circumstances, but it did change us. You know, we all had a different perspective when we knew that there was a plan and a destination. Yeah. And you're communicating that via the PA. Are you, is it a two-way communication? For example, once the flight attendants are up and out of the seats, are they communicating anything to you from the cabin? Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, we could not hear them for another 20,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they heard that, and there was a couple of passengers that heard it was, I think, providential because they could not hear me when I called them on the intercom. They could not hear anything and nor could we hear anything that they said for another 20,000 feet. It's almost, it was so it's, loud. It's almost like that unknown uh, would have just set fear across uh, everyone. Oh. but. Some, yeah, someone unknown is always fearful. Someone heard, and then they can relay that communication. So it's, right. it sounds like you said uh, those, those first few moments are just distilled in your mind. The next five minutes, you, it, it's taking to sort of get things situated in, uh, so that people know you're executing the plan to, to go to Philly. So, so what happens next after those, those first five minutes or so? Yeah, well, and during that time, Darren and I switched, and um, I entrusted all the the damage systems, checklists, and communication with the flight attendants to him. As we were coming down, we were going through the different air traffic control swaths of altitude quickly enough that we were needing to switch frequencies and talk to somebody new quite frequently. <laughs> and so we needed to divide our, our duties up so that uh, we could get something done. And I'm as the captain, I'm supposed to land emergency aircraft landings anyway. And I wanted to be able to have it high enough altitude that I could feel what, what it was flying like before we got low to the ground. So from there on, we're, we're just navigating to Philadelphia. And then whenever um, we've got some requests to slow down from the back um, because they were trying to get uh, our passenger back in. And then 
we realized as we came over the city and they said, you know, level at 6,000 and we needed to slow down anyway. So we leveled at six for a little while. And then we, uh, I realized we had such a chewed up wing. I could see that Garen couldn't, but also I was flying and could feel how heavy the controls were. And also the fact that we couldn't use all the thrust in the good engine because all the drag was pulling us left. And then the thrust was pushing us left. And there was only so much rudder authority we had. So we couldn't use all the thrust we had, which then made us realize we're on a glide path. We don't have flying level off capability. And so we never leveled off Um, from the time it happened. We were on a glide path to the runway and we just had to make some decisions on not only the ground track but when we lowered the gear and what amount of flaps and when do we put them down and and then getting the aircraft turned around that last 90 degrees of turn um was tough because we'd added enough power not to stay above the city but we couldn't turn into the powered engine without pulling power back which of course took away airspeed and altitude and so anyway there was just a lot of um figuring things out on the way down and we didn't have the use of any automation to do that. And um, so, you know, it was, it was just kind of, sometimes we had to make a, we had to make some of our own plays. They weren't all in the playbook. When you think back, uh, because the, the way you just told that story was so vivid and, 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 and I'm glad some time has passed too, so you can kind of have that retrospective look at it. But when you think back, was there was there anything that comes? To, is there anything that comes to mind now that uh, you know helped you help prepare you to handle that situation that day? Like, yeah, I mean, if I was going to get to look back and just pick out one, it was actually an assignment that was. Uh, not a good assignment. And it wasn't fair that it was assigned to me. So I would encourage those that are in a job where you feel like, man, I just got the, you know, the dirty dog task for no other reason than somebody doesn't like me. Well, when I got assigned to do out of control flight instructing for a year, um, all of my peers got to teach gunnery pattern, which was the creme de la creme of getting to instruct in T2s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they pulled my my qual. I got my test done and my lecture done, and I was getting ready to have my first flight in it. And the the skipper in the ops said, "No, I'm not going to have a girl flying guns in in my squadron in the Navy." Wow. And that, I mean, that was just bold faith. And the only person I could take my complaint to was the very man who declared it. So I thought, well, that's useless. And uh, I just went on to fly out of control flight. You know, it goes, you go up, climb to 30,000 feet, depart the aircraft, stalls, and even a spiral. And then the student tries to recover it. You do that about 10 times, climbing up every time and uh, depart, recover, repeat. And so, and then clean up the cockpit if somebody's tummy is not feeling so good on the way down. And, um, but honestly, that whole being in, in, a, in an aircraft that's radically departing controlled flight was not something that was foreign to me. Now, it had been a number of years, but once you do it, you kind of have that memory in your, in your, <laughs> in your G-forces. And so you, it wasn't something that startled me in not being able to react. Well, you know, I'd like to I'd like to ask uh, maybe if you could reflect on the the past year or so. What, what's life been like for you? Uh, you know, since uh, since flight thirteen eighty, and um, if you want to touch on too, maybe anything you're looking forward to in the near future. Oh, thanks. Well, um, the year past, I have to say, has been has been filled with some some sorrows as well as some joys. Um, of course, um, the loss of, of Jennifer Reardon on our flight, um, the, the survival of many never eclipses, the loss of one. And mm-hmm. so that, that weighs heavy on, weighs heavy on my heart, my crew's heart, my company's. And so, um, you know, that, 
starting off the past year and a half and but also realizing on the flip side getting to the runway was not a done deal <laughs> i i realize that so much and i don't know how how much anyone else realizes it but it it was um it was not a given and so of course rejoicing that we we did make a successful landing there uh, about 6 months after that my father passed away and so I felt like, um, of course, he lived a full life to 93, but there's still a hollow when that spot at the table isn't filled. And then um, my son went into the Air Force Academy as a freshman. That's certainly joyful. My daughter got married and is expecting her firstborn um, next week. So, you know, there's been ups and downs in the road. Uh, I've... I've had the privilege of meeting some very incredible people. One of which I would have to say is uh, Martha Raddatz. Uh, she was friends with my skipper in the Navy, Rosemary Mariner, who I will have to say also passed in this past year. Um, and, and just having done an interview with her and then having that friendship between us that we've met up since then. And, and then the um, the friendship between Franklin Graham and his family and mine has just been a treasure. And going up and being a part of his uh, Samaritan Purse um, program to um, minister to wounded warriors and their spouses in a great uh, week of a getaway for, for couples up in Alaska. Um, so I've gotten to to meet some some incredible people that really just was the beginning of the list it it continues but also enjoying um enjoying flying my day job yeah getting back to a sense of routine or normalcy uh after the whirlwind of the past year and a half is is sometimes is refreshing it it provides that sense of purpose that uh that maybe can get lost along the way. And I am, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your loss, but I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm excited for you to, uh, and your daughter and the new baby that on the way. That's uh, that's very, very incredible. Yes. That's going to be a special, special time. And it sounds like your, your son's following in, um, in your footsteps just in terms of the military. So that's, uh, that's an interesting new path for him to explore. Well, we've given him a hard time. You know, he's the son of two Navy pilots and he goes air force, <laughs> but, yeah. um, we we tell him, you know, is this how a good son rebels? And he comes back with, I'm bringing honor back to the family name. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. It'll be interesting <laughs> for every Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, we always like to uh, end with uh, any advice. And I'm sure the book, uh, Nerves of Steel, has some excerpts. But is there anything specifically you wanted to touch on? Maybe some encouragement for someone you know, facing adversity in their own life or just... Yeah, someone yeah. that's finding it a little harder to do something than they thought they than they thought it would be. Right. You know what? I I would say this, and it's uh, honestly, it's it's doing a book that has really helped me uh, look back and put some of the pieces in line. It, it, you have all these beads, but until you you do a book, I don't think you put them on a string, so to speak. And so I would encourage anybody that's going through adversity getting into staying in uh continuing on uh progressing in what you're doing that that spark that started you down that road you know i felt i feel like dreams are are not the end all of what we what we do it's it's putting some feet to those first of all does is it a dream that has merit do you have a good motive? But once you get started, that road ahead, it can be very long. It can be years. And sometimes you don't see any real success at the end of the road. But someday you'll look back and realize, wow, that was actually preparation. Um, I don't think I would be nearly as sure-footed in life or as uh, well-rounded as an aviator if everything had gone smoothly. So honestly, when you come on those rough patches, just know it's, it's training 
you know, is part of life's boot camp. And that gets you ready to make a difference. I think that's great advice. And it's just speaking to the audience in terms of whatever path they're on or whatever their ambition or, like you said, their dream. Uh, even if they feel like they're currently living their dream, there's there's always a reason for continued training, whether it's mm-hmm. something like attending a conference, taking an online course, uh, right. ne- networking, um, right. you know, it's, and it's all, it's all a juggling act with, uh, with real life, family, jobs, hobbies. So, so I appreciate the down to earth advice. That's great. Well, I think as we close this thing out, can you give people a little bit of a reminder of what's the, the title of the book, uh, where people can you know find it online, where they can connect with you? Okay, sure. And captain com is a great place to go if you want to connect with me. It's uh, Schultz, spelled S-H-U-L-T-S, no C, no Z. It's spelled odd. That's my husband's fault. And um, But CaptainSchultz.com is how you can get to me. Also, if you want to just read the first four chapters of the book, you can pull it up there. Um, The book is on pre-sale now, really any place that books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, um, Walmart, Hobby Lobby. I I don't know if I've left anybody at Christian uh, Christian Bookstore. I don't know. I believe it's called Christian Books. And so there's going to be an Audible version. There's a junior version or a young reader, eight to fourteen year old. And there's an Audible coming out for that as well. November is when the younger version is coming out. Oh, that's so. great. And I just want to remind everyone too that you, you're still working. So, uh, yes. <laughs> ch- chat up the chat up the flight attendants. Maybe ask them is uh, <laughs> is Captain Schultz here? And if they say no, uh, you know, ask them if have you ever met Captain Schultz? And maybe they have some. <sighs> Maybe they have some stories to tell, and, and if they do... I don't uh, know if I wanted to tell all my <laughs> stories, but truthfully, if you fly a Southwest jet, please pop your head in the cockpit. We always like to see passengers. Sometimes we're up there getting weather or or the clearance or something, but we always have time to say hi, so Just pop hi- your head up in the cockpit. Yeah, there you go. Great advice. Hi, Captain. Hi, hi First Officer. Yeah. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Well, great advice. Well, uh, Tammy Joe, thanks so much for, for taking the time, I, and I think people are going to get a lot out of uh, your story and they can pick up a copy of your book uh, if they want to learn more. Well, thanks for having me on Telling Stories. Absolutely. Captain Tammy Jo Schultz. Wow. (sighs) What a story. It seemed like she hit one roadblock after another on her way to becoming a pilot and she she just looks back on it as as training, as a as just a part of the journey. And just hearing everything that went into successfully landing flight 1380 and all that's happened since in her life, I just find fascinating. All right, that's it for this episode. Quick reminder, if you're new to the show, please hit subscribe on wherever you listen to the podcast. And if you liked Tammy Joe's story, then please let us know in the comments section. Also, you can send us a message at guystellingstories.com where we have an archive of all of our past episodes. And also, that's the best place to uh, get in touch if you want to shoot us a message. All right. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, I'm Rich Douglas. Until next time.